Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. P is a positive real number. We have a summation, G from 1 to N, G to the power P. From this sum, we subtract N to the P plus 1, divided by P plus 1. The difference is divided by N to the P. We are interested in the limit of this quantity as N tends to infinity. Let's first investigate the relation between this sum and this term here, N to the P plus 1 over P plus 1. Specifically, I will investigate the limit as n tends to infinity of the sum k from 1 to n k to the p divided by n to the p plus 1. We can split this into 1 over n times 1 over n to the p and take this inside the sum. We have summation k from 1 to n, k divided by n, all raised to the power p. Then we have an outside factor 1 over n. As k goes from 1 to n, k over n goes from 1 over n to n over n, which is 1. The step is 1 over n, which is this outside factor. We have a Riemann sum. As n tends to infinity, this converges to the integral v from 0 to 1 of v to the power p. If p is greater than minus 1, this integral is equal to 1 over p plus 1. The conclusion is that the sum k from 1 to n k to the p divided by n to the p plus 1 over p plus 1 tends to 1 as n tends to infinity. This summation and this quantity are asymptotically equal. We investigate the limit as n tends to infinity of their difference divided by n to the p. From this result here, replace p by p minus 1, we get that the limit as n tends to infinity of 1 over n to the p, summation k from 1 to n k to the p minus 1 is equal to 1 over p. We need b minus 1 to be greater than minus 1, then p is strictly positive. Because this summation is finite, if we multiply by 1 over n to the delta, where delta is a positive real number, as n tends to infinity, this approaches 0, this approaches 1 over p, so the limit of this product as n tends to infinity is equal to 0. If the positive integers are raised to the power p minus 1, and we divide here by n to the power p, so the power here is 1 more than the power inside the sum, the limit is 1 over p. If the power of n here exceeds this power by more than 1, then the limit is equal to 0. As we have seen, the limit of the ratio of these two quantities is straightforward via the Riemann sum, but our problem involves the difference. To be able to investigate this, we need the following tool, this is Abel's identity or partial summation formula. n is a positive integer. Let's define ax to be 0 if x is strictly less than 1. If x is 1 or more, then ax is equal to the summation of the sequence an, small n is less than or equal to x. According to this definition, if x is greater than or equal to 1, but is strictly less than 2, ax is equal to small a of 1. If x is greater than or equal to 2, but is strictly less than 3, then big A of x is equal to small a of 1 plus small a of 2. If x is greater than or equal to 3, but is strictly less than 4, big A of x is equal to small a of 1 plus small a of 2 plus small a of 3, and so forth. Generally, if we have a positive integer g, and x is greater than or equal to g, but is strictly less than g plus 1, then in this summation, small n is from 1 to g. We have the sum small a of 1 all the way to small a of g. This is the definition of big A of x. Abel's identity also involves a function. The function is assumed to be differentiable on this closed interval from y to x. The first derivative of function f is continuous. The identity that will help us with our limit is that the sum of small e of n, f of n, the index small n is strictly greater than y, but is less than or equal to x. This sum is equal to big A of x, f of x, minus big A of y, f of y, minus an integral t from y to x, big A of t times the derivative of f with respect to t. Let's prove this identity starting from the left-hand side. Small a of n is equal to big A of n, which is the sum from a1 to a n, minus big A of n minus 1, which is the sum from small a of 1 to small a of n minus 1. The difference is this small a n. Split this summation into two terms. So we have summation small n from the floor of y plus 1, and this is because n is strictly greater than y. The upper limit of summation is the floor of x because n is less than or equal to x. Big A of n, f of n. Minus the second sum I write using the index m. So we have summation small m from the floor of y plus 1 to the floor of x. Then we have big A of m minus 1, f of m. In this sum, do the substitution m equal to n plus 1. A of m minus 1 becomes A of n. F of m becomes f of n plus 1. If m is equal to the floor of y plus 1, then n is equal to the floor of y. If m is equal to the floor of x, n is equal to the floor of x minus 1. Note that in the sums, we have big A of n here and there. 
before combining the two sums from this summation here, we isolate the term corresponding to the floor of X, big A of the floor of X times F of the floor of X. And from this summation here, we isolate the term corresponding to small n equal to the floor of wall. This is A of the floor of wall, F of the floor of wall plus one. This sum is equal to this quantity minus that one minus summation, small n from the floor of y plus one to the floor of x minus one. The sum is big A of n, then the difference f of n plus one minus f of n. f is assumed to be continuously differentiable. So this difference here can be written as the integral of the first derivative of f from n to n plus one. Based on our investigation of the function big A, if t is between n and n plus one, then a of t is equal to a of n. Because big A of n is a constant, we can take it inside the integral. Then we can exploit this equality to change A of n to A of t. We have this sum, integral t from small n to small n plus one, big A of t, f prime of t. We can write down this sum of integrals as one integral from the floor of y plus one all the way to this upper limit plus one. This is the floor of x. Write down this integral as an integral from y to x. To have an equal sign here, we need to subtract the integral from y to the floor of y plus one. We also need to subtract the integral from the floor of x to x. So this integral with the minus sign is minus integral t from y to x, a of t, f prime of t. We need to add these two integrals. t here is between the floor of x and x. a of t is equal to a of the floor of x, which can be taken outside the integral. When we do so, we have the integral of the first derivative of f from the floor of x to x, this is f of x minus f of the floor of x. Similarly, we go to this integral, t is between y and the floor of y plus one. From the definition of a of t, a of t here is equal to a of the floor of y. This can be taken outside. We have an integral, which is the difference f of the floor of y plus one minus f of y. Note that we get cancellations. This term here is canceled by this product this term here is cancelled by that product. Doing the cancellations, we get that the sum is equal to a, the floor of x, f of x. Recall that if eta is greater than or equal to one, a of eta is summation, n less than or equal to eta of small a of n. a of eta is equal to a of the floor of eta. This term here can be written as a of x. We have minus a, the floor of y, which can be written as a of y, times f of y, and then we have the integral. This is our desired result, which allows us to represent a summation in terms of an integral. Suppose that the sequence small a is the all one sequence. Big A of x is summation, index j less than or equal to x of one. There are floor of x terms in this summation. If sequence small a is equal to one, the function big A of x is the floor of x. Let f of t be t to the power p where p is a positive real number. Let's use this identity with y equal to zero and x equal to the positive integer n. In this case, the floor of x is equal to n. Summation index k from y to x, small a of k, f of k, those are ones, f of k is k to the power p. This summation here is summation k from one to n, k to the p. a of x is equal to n, f of x is n to the power p because x is equal to n. y is zero, so f of y is equal to zero. Our integral is from y to x, that is from zero to n. The first derivative of f is p, t to the p minus one. a of t is the floor of t. We obtain that the summation k from one to n of k to the power p is equal to n to the p plus one minus integral t from zero to n, the floor of t, p, t to the p minus one. We can rewrite this n to the p plus one as integral from zero to n, p plus one, t to the p, dt. Split this integrand into p, t to the power p plus t to the power p, if we apply the integral to this term, we get n to the p plus one divided by p plus one. Then we have the integral t from zero to n, p, t to the p, dt. We have also this integral here, minus t from zero to n, p, the floor of t, t to the p minus one. Let's combine the two integrals. The summation k from one to n, k to the p, is this integral here, which is n to the p plus one over p plus one. We can take p outside. We have integral t from zero to n, t to the p minus one, t minus the floor of t. Split this integral into n integrals. The jth integral is from j to j plus one, and j goes from zero to small n minus one. Inside each integral, the variable t is from j to j plus one, so the floor of t is equal to j. The integrand here is t to the p 
minus g t to the p minus 1. If we do the integration, we have 1 over p plus 1, t to the p plus 1, and the limits of integration from g to g plus 1. From here, we get minus g over p, t to the p. Also, we have the limits of integration from g to g plus 1. Here is what we get after using the limits of integration. If we take this p inside, we get p here. This p goes away. Take 1 over p plus 1 as a common factor. These two terms become p g plus 1 to the p plus 1 minus p g to the p plus 1. Then we have two terms from here. Each has the factor p plus 1. If we expand this term, we get p times g to the p plus 1 plus g to the p plus 1. These two terms go away. To process these two terms, take g plus 1 to the p as a common factor. We get from here p times g plus 1, so that's b g plus p. And from here we get minus p g minus g. This bracket is equal to p minus g. The summand is equal to g to the p plus 1 plus p minus g times g plus 1 to the power p. When g is equal to 0, this is 0, this is 1, and this is p. We isolate this term and start our sum from g equal to 1. Write this bracket here as g to the p times 1 plus g to the minus 1 to the p. Let's do the binomial expansion of this bracket here. Note that p is a real number that is strictly positive. 1 plus g to the minus 1 all to the p is equal to summation m from 0 to infinity. The binomial coefficient pm g to the minus 1 to the power m. Note that p is not necessarily an integer. How do we define this binomial coefficient? It is equal to a ratio. In the denominator, we have the factorial of n. In the numerator, we have p times p minus 1 all the way to p minus m plus 1. We have m terms multiplied together in the numerator. When m is equal to 0, this is 1. When m is equal to 1, we have g to the minus 1 times p. When n is equal to 2, we have g to the minus 2 multiplied by p times b minus 1 divided by 2 factorial, which is 2. These are the three terms corresponding to small m equal to 0, 1, and 2. The remaining terms are all lumped together in this summation, small m, an integer greater than or equal to 3. Multiply this bracket, which is 1 plus the reciprocal of g, all to the power p, times this other bracket, which is p, g to the p, minus g to the p plus 1. When we do the multiplication, we get this summation starting from small m equal to 3, multiplied by this difference. Then we get all these terms. These two are the survivors after simplification. We move this term to the left-hand side because this is the difference of interest. We divide by n to the p. We need now to take the limit of the right-hand side as n tends to infinity. This term goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. What about this term? We have summation, g is raised to the power p minus 2, and then we have 1 over n to the p. Early in this video, we have the result that 1 over n to the p plus delta, summation g to the p minus 1, converges to 1 over p if delta is equal to 0, and to 0 if delta is strictly positive. To get a non-zero result here, we need this power to be 1 more than that power. If the difference is more than 1, then the limit is 0. Here we have n to the p, and the power here is p minus 2. So this goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. What about this term here? We have 1 over n to the power p, 1 half times p, summation g from 1. Let's take it all the way to n. Then g to the p minus 1 minus n to the p minus 1. n to the p minus 1 divided by n to the p goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. This summation divided by n to the p tends to 1 over p as n tends to infinity. This quantity tends to 1 half as n tends to infinity. To obtain our final result, we still need to investigate the limit of this sum here divided by n to the p as n tends to infinity. As n tends to infinity, these terms tend to 0. This term tends to 1 half. If we can show that these terms tend to 0, then the left-hand side tends to 1 half as n tends to infinity. These two sums can be handled in a similar way. I will focus on this sum here, where g is raised to the power p plus 1 minus m. The binomial coefficient pm is p, p minus 1, p minus 2, all the way to p minus m plus 1 over m factorial. Suppose that m is greater than or equal to 1 plus the ceiling of p. E. If p is an integer, the binomial coefficient is 0. Let's investigate the absolute value of the binomial coefficient if p is not an integer. In the numerator, we have p, p minus 1, to b minus the floor of p. The next term is p minus the floor of p minus 1. We are taking the absolute value. So this is the floor of p plus 1 minus p. The last term, which is p minus m plus 1, and because m is greater than or equal to 1 plus the ceiling of p, this absolute value is m minus 1 minus p.
in the denominator, we have the factorial of M, which is 1 times 2 all the way to the ceiling of P minus 1, the ceiling of P, then the ceiling of P plus 1, the ceiling of P plus 2, to M minus 1 times M. In this part, we find fractions that are less than or equal to 1. Each P in the numerator is replaced by the ceiling of P in the denominator. We have the same conclusion on this side. Here we have M. Here we have M minus 1 minus P. Here is M minus 1. But upstairs, we have M minus 1, minus 1, minus P, and so forth. If M is superior to 1 plus the ceiling of P, the magnitude of the binomial coefficient is less than or equal to 1. Note that this condition is guaranteed to be true if the ceiling of P is equal to 1 or 2. Because in our sums here, M is greater than or equal to 3. Note also that if M is less than or equal to the ceiling of P, we are guaranteed to get a positive binomial coefficient. In the numerator, we have P, P minus 1, P minus 2, and the last term is P minus M plus 1. If M is less than or equal to the ceiling of P, minus M is greater than or equal to minus the ceiling of P, we add P plus 1 on both sides. This bracket here is lower bounded by P plus 1 minus the ceiling of P, which is greater than or equal to 0, because the ceiling of P is between P and P plus 1. Let's deal with this case first. The ceiling of P is either 1 or 2. We are interested in the limit of this double sum, as n tends to infinity. We separate the part corresponding to j equal to 1. This summation here, if it starts from 0, it is equal to 2 to the p. 2 to the p divided by n to the p tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. The magnitude of this part by the triangle inequality is less than or equal to 1 over n to the p, summation j from 2 to n minus 1, m greater than or equal to 3, j to the p plus 1 minus m, multiplied by the absolute value of the binomial coefficient. M is greater than or equal to the ceiling of P plus 1. We can upper bound this magnitude by 1. This double sum is equal to summation G from 2 to small n minus 1, G to the P plus 1, summation M from 3 to infinity, 1 over G to the power M. 1 over G is strictly less than 1. We have a convergent geometric series. This is 1 over G cubed divided by 1 minus 1 over G, which is equal to 1 over G squared divided by G minus 1. Multiplying by this g to the p plus 1, the sum of now is g to the p minus 1 divided by g minus 1. g is from 2 to n minus 1. g is greater than or equal to 2. Add g to both sides. So g plus g is greater than or equal to g plus 2. 2g two minus 2 is greater than or equal to g. So 1 over 2 between brackets g minus 1 is less than or equal to 1 over g. 1 over g minus 1 is less than or equal to 2 over g. We use this upper bound here. The summation is g from 2 to n minus 1, g to the p minus 2, divided by n to the p. Here we have p, here we have p minus 2. As n tends to infinity, this goes to 0. If the ceiling of p is 3 or more, we do the same. We isolate the term corresponding to j equal to 1. Regarding the summation over m, we split into two sums. In the first one, m is from 3 to the ceiling of p. In the second one, m is greater than or equal to 1 plus the ceiling of p. We manipulate this term like here. The magnitude is upper bounded by this double sum. The sum has the absolute value of the binomial coefficient. Because m is greater than or equal to 1 plus the ceiling of p, this absolute value is less than or equal to 1. We get a geometric series. We use the inequality that for j greater than or equal to 2, 1 over j minus 1 is less than or equal to 2 over j. In this sum, j is raised to the power p minus the ceiling of p. Here we have n to the power p. The ceiling of p is greater than or equal to 3. So this summation here also tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. In this last part, because m is less than or equal to the ceiling of p, the binomial coefficient is non-negative. We can upper bound the binomial coefficients by their maximum over m from 3 to the ceiling of p. j to the p plus 1 minus m is less than or equal to j to the p plus 1 minus 3 because m is greater than or equal to 3. If we sum with respect to m, there is no m in the upper bound. So this summation is the ceiling of b minus 2. We end up with a sum in which j is raised to the power p minus 2. We are dividing by n to the p, so this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. These guys tend to 0 as n tends to infinity. Our limit of interest is 1 half.